This is the Monday, December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day 2015 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show. Thank you so much for joining us on our iHeartRadio channel. And if you're catching us on iTunes, TuneIn Radio, or some other outlet on the great Internet Card Catalog, we're also really glad you're here. And we want to thank you for clicking through the Amazon banner on our site when you make a purchase at their online store. It helps keep us in highlighters. And we go through a lot of highlighters here. Lonesome Moonlit Nights Listening to the Hit Parade. Foxholes. The front lines of Germany. On Memorial Day 2006, one month and one day after her father Bud's death at the age of 84, Teresa Irish raised the lid on his old army trunk and discovered nearly 1,000 letters he'd written home during World War II. Bud Irish had addressed the now yellowed pages to his parents and to the sweetheart who would later become his wife and Teresa's mother, Elaine Marie Corbett. Bud earned the Silver Star, the Purple Heart, and the Bronze Star. Correspondence from the heartbroken mothers whose sons died by his side are also in the trunk. Teresa Irish shares her father's personal reflections in the book A Thousand Letters Home. It's a story of life and loss, hope and perseverance, and the girl back home following the Andrews sisters urging, don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me. I learned Teresa Irish's unique story at her website, a thousand letters home.com and by following her at thousand letters on Twitter. Born in Saginaw, Teresa is a graduate of Michigan State University, and she's not just the author slash editor of A Thousand Letters Home, she's also the publisher and distributor of what's truly a labor of love. Here's our conversation. I'm on the line with Teresa Irish, author of A Thousand Letters Home, or I guess I should say co-author along with her late father, Bud. Teresa, welcome and thank you so much for making time for us. Hey, Dean. My pleasure. I'm delighted to be with you. Well, this is a book I've been looking forward to for a while. And one reason is you're really not an author per se. Your goal in life was never to write a book. You didn't have that great American novel in you. You just decided when you found this trunk full of letters that you wanted to make this intimidating climb to getting published. And that's something we talked about in our very first episode with Stephen Bedford from Simon & Schuster. That's a hard climb to make and that top of the mountain to try to get published. How did you decide to open that trunk and get it from those letters all the way to the bookshelf? Well, you know, it's interesting that you start with that question because I'm a full-time speaker now based on the response to the book and the accompanying message of citizenship that we have in the presentation of the journey of the letters. And I actually open it stating that I am an unintended author. I don't intend to write another book. Uh, I never intended to bring this one to print. But uh, gosh, Dean, it it was a month after my dad passed away when I opened his army trunk. And we had known our entire lives about the trunk. And some 16 years before I was even born, it was there. And we used to say, hey, Dad, how about we come home someday and open the trunk with you? And he would always respond, maybe someday. And we never pushed. He never invited. So the contents remained a mystery. A month after he passed away, it was Memorial Day weekend. I was traveling at the time 45 weeks a year, flying around the country in my work. And I uh, just told my mom I needed a good down weekend to kind of let the emotions flow. And I went to their house in Saginaw, Michigan, and I opened my dad's army trunk. And there were literally his 1,000 handwritten letters all in the original envelopes from November 1942 until he came home on the Norway victory from France in uh, December of 1940, uh, January rather of 1946. It was very, very soon after, Dean, that I knew that I needed to share the letters 
as I traveled with some of the originals and would share them to, with people within one or two sentences, people would say, oh gosh, my uncle was at Normandy Beach or my brother was killed in Vietnam or my dad served in Korea. And I started to realize that although these letters are my dad's story, literally from his very first day at boot camp at Fort Custer in Michigan through Camp Maxi, Camp Swift, Fort Dix, across the boat ride into Germany and 194 consecutive days in northern France and Germany, wow. I realized that these resonated with everyone who had someone in their family that had made that same journey as a soldier. And the response was just tremendous. And so I continued to work through and to do a compilation of them and ultimately bought it to print. A thousand letters. Just the emotion in each one when you read through it, it's heavy for a person that's not related to Bud Irish. We, he's a very expressive writer. He always signs off with some love. He'll write lots of X's and O's. I think we tend to think of these guys in World War II as just iron and spitting bullets and you know killing four Nazis before breakfast. And we have this sort of movie idea of what they're like, but you feel emotional just reading his letters. And then I thought for a child, even an adult child as you were at the time, you just lost your father. You might set that trunk full of letters aside, just as I guess he did from your description, and decide, you know, I'm not ready to look at them just yet. Maybe someday you would start telling yourself. But instead of letting that pain sort of rule you and deter you, you decided not just to read them, but to compile this whole book. And I do have one reading here, so let's go to that. This is Joseph Reed. People who listen to the show by now know Amanda Reed, who's one of our correspondents here. Her brother, Joseph, is a little bit younger than your father was at the time that he shipped out, but I wanted to get a, another man's voice here, somebody young that could sort of feel this letter and read one to us. So let's do that, and then we'll continue talking about A Thousand Letters Home. Dear Mom, Dad, and all, if anyone ever believed in miracles, I certainly do now. You remember in my last letter I wrote about the two pistols I had gotten from German soldiers? Now they've got them back and everything of mine with it, but I'm safe and sound so I can't complain any. I can't tell you much now because of censorship regulations, but I'll tell you what I can. Mom, that four-leaf clover you sent me was supposed to be for good luck but no one will ever know just how lucky I was or what all your prayers pulled me through. It all seems like a bad dream now, and the time that went by seemed like years. All the stories I've heard of people playing dead or laying right next to a buddy when he was killed came true to me in the matter of a couple of hours. We had to jump from our jeep when the Germans started shooting with everything they had, and it so happened that right where we stopped were a few rocks to give us protection. The fellows with armored cars did all they could to get us under cover, but no one could move an inch from cover without getting hit. My buddy and I laid behind the rocks while bullets hit so close that pieces of stone would hit us, and a small piece even hit my cheek. There aren't words to say how scared we were and how hard we prayed. The only satisfaction I've got is to know that I hit two of them with bullets from my rifle and saw them fall. Two days later we found them still there, dead. When our fellows were forced to move back for more cover, their German SS troopers came down the road and there were so many we didn't have a chance. One saw us, and from a distance of not over ten feet, he sprayed us with a gun similar to our Tommies. My buddy was between him and me and was lying so close that I could feel the bullets hit him. I'll never know how they missed me, but someone must have been praying hard for me. I dropped on my face and laid there to make them think I was dead, and one of them jerked the rifle from my hands and hit us both over the head. I laid there and thought they would never leave, and after they finally did, I didn't know what to do but lie there till dark. About a half hour later, I heard them coming back, and my heart was beating so hard, it seemed like they should have heard it. They got in our jeep about ten feet ahead of where we were lying, and drove it off and with it everything I owned. I didn't mind anything except my stationary folder, and my folders with the pictures of you folks in a lane. I had always carried them in my shirt pocket till four days before when I put on another shirt and left the pictures in the one I had in the jeep. After that I laid there for almost two hours thinking that there was no one left and that my only chance was to wait till dark. It was like waiting a million years. About two hours before it got dark, I heard someone behind me ask for help. The fellows could run for it and I guess it was nothing but the help of God that took me out of there. I ran and then would drop in the ditch so they couldn't hit. 
A little further back, under a bridge, I heard a fellow call my name. I looked, and it was the fellow who always drove my Jeep. Dear folks, I don't think I was ever happier to see anyone still alive. And he wasn't hit bad enough that he won't be okay in a couple months. I don't know how to explain the way I've felt since I'm back, but there's a feeling that you just never want to see another live German. You just feel that they never gave your buddies a chance and that they should never get one. I know I've got to change it, and after a good night's sleep I'll feel better, but I don't think I can ever stop hating them. One of the fellas, a sergeant, always went to mass and communion with me. He was the kind of fellow you could depend on to help you regardless of what it might cost him. We made an agreement a long time ago that if anything ever happens to the other, the one left would write to the other's folks when the censorship time period was up. He used to sit and tell me of his folks, and he was always smiling. I can't explain it, but when you know that because someone else took all the bullets that might otherwise have gotten you, a person feels he just can never do enough to make up for them. Maybe you'd better let Elaine read this letter, because I may not have time to write to her today. Just keep your chins in the air and keep praying and saying that I'll be coming home. One of these days, the war will be over, and I'll be seeing you. Worlds of love to all, bud. When you're reading that, I'm picturing you cross-legged with kind of the trunk open and all these letters scattered around you. What's your reaction to that? Well, you know, that one was rather bittersweet, Dean, because you see, unlike so many of our veterans, my dad actually did talk about the war. He talked about the war on Christmas Eve. There were Mitz Fisher Price toys and music and grandkids. He might raise his hands and say, you know, 48 years ago tonight or 56 years ago tonight and ultimately 62 years ago. Um, and so he had talked about the events. We knew that he had the Silver Star and the Purple Heart and two Bronze Battle Stars. But, you know, I don't believe in regret. You should turn emotion into action. But if I had one, it's probably that I thought I had heard that story so many times in my life. And then, of course, when I read my dad's letter of the events of April 9th that he wrote to his mom and dad the day that his, his three buddies, Don Case, Jack and Barney Stone, were killed, I wanted to take back time, of course, and have a conversation and, and talk about it because I grew up seeing my dad as a sort of governing body in my life. And all of a sudden, here I was reading about him as a young man with events that we didn't possibly begin to know the detail or understand. And it really makes you realize an awful lot in our world today about the choices that those young boys really had. They weren't talking about what they were going to study or where they were going to college. And so many of them never left their communities, let alone their countries, to go do what they did. And it was a very, very bittersweet time. I would love to have had the opportunity back to talk to him and ask him so much more now. But of course, as I sat at the foot of his empty chair at that time, then it just wasn't an option. But I feel so fortunate to have it today. And that's a very big part of the presentation today is that particular letter. You mentioned these young people. That's something you notice the guys he's serving with in the book, because in A Thousand Letters Home, there's much more than just letters that people might think it's just a book of letters, which is compelling enough. His written word, as I said, he's a very good writer and illustrates things and has a lot of range of emotion. But you also put in a lot of photographs in there and you have poetry that your sister wrote, Linda Irish Larson. I guess your sister is the writer in the family or the one who intended to write. Describe some of those photographs that you have in there. Well, along with his 1,000 letters, he had a photograph album all put together in the trunk that had 250 corresponding photographs all throughout Europe, some of them with the atrocities, including at Gardlagen, as the Germans retreated and they locked a barn with the slave laborers inside and set it on fire as they retreated, of course, so that they couldn't testify against them. Gosh. I didn't really understand at first my dad's decision to have some of those until a couple months after I'd seen them so many times, Dean, I turned over one of the photos and it had three very simple, poignant words and I understood. And my dad had simply written on the back, pictures don't lie. And so we uh, decided it was important to include those and it's a very important part of our history. So we published 320 of the letters and 104 corresponding photographs in the book. Yeah, I read the one letter where he said, He's on occupation duty before the end of the war, I believe, but obviously they're already in Germany. And he says that the local people don't believe the atrocities that we've seen. And 
I always thought that that was one of Dwight D. Eisenhower's supreme inspired moments of wisdom was to take people and march them through there and get the cameras in and record it because he said someday people are going to deny it. And I wonder how he had that insight because you wouldn't have thought it was possible anyone ever could. But the fact that we have those photographs in the book and these people, it shows that they're real people and real things happen. Right. Well, you know, I'm asked all the time, tell me your dad's background. Tell me about his parents. Because people are so surprised that at 20 years old and in such adverse, difficult circumstances, he's so deep and he's so reflective. He was a high school graduate, a 20-year-old dairy farmer from a little town of Hemlock, Michigan. It's really quite astounding, and it's kind of a good chuckle. He writes in the letters that he's a really bad letter writer, and he's written more than he ever wrote before he came in. And, you know, he apologizes, actually, for his writing. And it's just astounding because uh, people ask me all the time, you know, where did he get that from? And there's really three themes to the book. You know, Letters from Iwo Jima, wonderful book, wonderful movie, bags of letters from multiple soldiers at one point in time. This has a real historical significance in that it's one soldier's entire journey through World War II, literally from his first days at boot camp to 38 months later coming home on the Norway victory, as I mentioned, after seeing such amazing atrocities. And he wrote all the way through. So it's a firsthand real-time account of our soldier's journey in World War II. Second, it's a beautiful love story. He got engaged to my mother before he went away, put a, an engagement ring on his, her finger and the accompanying life savings, whatever that is for a dairy farmer in Hemlock, <laughs> Michigan at the age of 20, into the savings and loan. And so they went off and in the book, they, have a, they go back and forth a lot. He doesn't know, should he marry her before he goes or not? But the love story in the book and how that's conveyed through music from Waltz Time and Hit Parade and Countdowns are beautiful. And the third theme, it's a beautiful book of faith. His faith is huge. It's very, very apparent throughout the story. He struggles whether or not he should become a chaplain's assistant or stay with the guys that he's trained with and go into battle, which ultimately, of course, is his decision. But there are three really different themes for it. It has a little something for everyone, but also is a, just an amazing, remarkable, real-time way to remember and honor our history, particularly our veterans of World War II. And he's so honest. That's a tough thing to be, especially writing letters. I, I don't know if the war influences that or he was just always very open. I guess so, because you said he talked about his experience in the way a lot of soldiers don't want to talk about it. They just aren't able to. It's not even if they want to or not. They just mm -hmm. prefer to keep it locked away like that trunk. And one of the letters that I picked out for another voiceover is when he's talking to your mother and he's kind of finally decided to make this decision. She's not your mother yet, obviously, but even when you're reading it, you're thinking, let them get together because it's already so clear how much love he has. So, <laughs> Well, you know, that's funny, Dean, you say that because when I was putting all the letters together, I, two, my two oldest sisters typed them for me. And my sister, Linda, actually hadn't been a writer before. Oh, okay. She just was typing up letters that I sent her, select letters, and she kind of felt carried away. And all of a sudden, she would send me this extra document that had a poem that went with the letters. It was astounding. But I got so engrossed in the letters, I said to my sisters, okay, maybe I shouldn't tell them the rest of the story, like what happened and all. And they're like, um, it's your dad. I think they'll figure it out. And I was like, oh, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it, it sort of took me away to a third person. <laughs> yeah, you're sort of just meeting him, as you say, as a young person. And so you know the end, but it's so easy to forget. It. And I find that that's very good history writing is when you read a biography about somebody, even when you know the end of their story, you're rooting for them. Yeah. You do that, especially with, with the <laughs> war. Like we're always sort of rooting because uh, <laughs> you see what's happening and you see the great adversity that they faced in World War II. And you really want the good guys to win. And you want people that are bad, that are doing legitimately bad things, whoever's face they're wearing or uniform that they're wearing, we want them to really get what's coming to them and be defeated. And that's yeah. something he really comes across in the book. He's not only struggling with the world, but it's through this little lens of him whether or not he wants to get married. it's He's thinking of his future. And so many of those guys didn't have a future. They didn't know that they didn't, that it makes it even more powerful that he went on to live this life that was denied to millions around the world. Well, you know, you're right, Dean. One of the themes, again, I do full-time speaking now. We've been really honored to share the story at over 200 venues since April of 2012. But one of the things that I share is I was asked once in an interview if I thought my dad had survivor guilt. 
And I almost recoiled because if you read his optimism in the book and all these optimistic sayings he made us say as little kids, you know, dream your work and work your dreams and you become what you think about and things you kind of rolled your eyes about when you were young. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't help but respond to the question by answering that really my dad had survivor purpose. Huh. And one of the things that I take that's a very important message about citizenship today that I talk about and a message to our current veterans, I mean, our Vietnam veterans who are dying at a younger age than any veterans of any war because of the psychological issues associated with it, the new types of injuries and traumatic issues and PTSD our new soldiers have. But one of the things that is so powerful to me in my dad's letters is that although his buddies die and although he lives and saw the things that he did, he felt just the opposite when he came home. Because his buddies wanted to live so much and they didn't make it, he felt that he had to make more of his life almost to live for them. And I think about that when you think of people's struggle with cancer and all these things you hear about in our world today, and then you see about people struggling and suicides from bullying and people just kind of giving up on the world. And you want to think, gosh, there's so many people that wanted so much and gave all to have life. And I'm, I'm really proud and honored that my dad's message really is one of survivor purpose, even all these decades later. It seems like it would have been a really hard thing to go through this <laughs> when you're reading those letters. It just amazes me that you have been able to find such purpose for yourself in it and help him share this message with people because it would have been so easy, like I said, to just put it aside or just read one and say, I can't do it. It really does seem like it was a purpose and all meant to be. And I just want to say, because it seems like such a narrative, this is all his letters. You didn't fictionalize any of this. This is pure letters and it changed your life really. So you can imagine what it does for other people. It has that power, I think, this story, the book, the journey that you've been on. It has just been the most amazing. And I, I'm sure gift probably sounds a little trite, but I was in the corporate world for many, many years. I traveled uh, 16 years. I traveled for 40 to 45 weeks a year, literally on a plane every year. And, you know, there was always something missing about where I was supposed to use my talents for something that felt more purposeful to me. And as soon as I started this journey with the letters, I found out what it was. And it did take me 13 months to read them all because of the emotion and they were so frail. I mean, some of the letters Dean had as many as 12 pages of that thin onion paper written on both sides in tiny hand script in one envelope. Wow. So it took a long time. It was incredibly emotional, but it never stopped being being inspiring. And in the end, amazing twist to the story, I found in my dad's trunk, five of the letters that are now in the book are from two of the mothers of two soldiers that died on April 9th next to him. And my dad had written to them and they wrote him back. And the, the, the letters are to me are some of the most poignant, as you might imagine, a mother's broken heart, they're filled with questions. Do you think Don was afraid to die? Do you think he wanted to come home and work the farm? Do you think he believed in heaven? And I found the living siblings of those soldiers after I found the letters to share their mother's letters with them from all those decades ago. And they became part of this journey with me. And ultimately, I'm happy to tell you, I became a first time bride at the age of 49 because of my dad's letters. <laughs> That's the amazing part. Yeah. Sitting at the airport one day waiting to board my plane and there were 16 soldiers in their battle dress uniforms, I assumed headed to the Middle East. And I asked the guy across the aisle for me if he was, and uh, we struck up conversation and I shared the letters and he went off to the Middle East. And six months later, he came back and we were married two and a half years later and actually debuted the book at our wedding. Funny story, we met on an airplane on the way to Atlanta and he continued on to the Middle East and he went, lived one mile from me here in the Metro Detroit area. Huh. Wow. So uh, I'd like to say my dad left me his legacy and gave me my future is now I'm an army wife. My husband's a colonel and uh, we'll be heading off again and uh, tour in Europe very shortly for the next year. So I'm proud. I'm honored. I'm proud to have been an army daughter. Didn't realize it enough in my dad's lifetime. And now I have the opportunity to share that as an army wife as well. And just hopefully can bring a, a little bit of both healing, inspiration, laughter, maybe tears and some good memories to my audiences. You said that you wish you could talk to him more about his experience. I wish I'd asked him this or that question. And usually this is where in the interview somebody would say, 
oh, hey, what would you say to him if you could talk to him? Or what do you think he would say about the book or this or that? But those are unknowables. But one thing that we can know, and this goes to your current work going around doing public speaking about it, is what advice do you have for the young person today who maybe has a father or mother who's being deployed or who had an experience in one of the wars past. What do you encourage them to do? Because this is a hard subject to broach and you have to find your peace with it while they're alive, I think, because you want to at least maybe say you support them or emotionally or if they ever want to talk about it, just so you don't have any of that regret afterwards. So how would you tell them to approach that? Well, you know, It's interesting. I presented at a college recently, and a young college student asked me the question after the program, and she addressed it in the audience and said, my dad has told me to never ask my grandfather about Vietnam, and I'd like to know what your thoughts are about that and whether or not you would agree. And, of course, respectfully understanding that her dad understands the emotion that his father may feel about the war. But I said to her, you know, I think that there's probably good reason that he feels that and he may find that he doesn't want to talk about it with you. But I do have to tell you, I would have a really hard time believing that as a 19 or 20 year old that your grandfather wouldn't be both proud of you and appreciate appreciative of the fact that you took the time to reflect and understand the sacrifices and the pain and the service that came to giving our freedoms today. And people can say, you know, they don't want to talk about it. They don't like to talk about it. It's sort of like when someone dies and people don't mention their name because it's sort of like if you don't talk about it, they won't think about it. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we all carry all that in our hearts. And that's why I think I get such a wonderful response. I mean, some of our events I know to pass out Kleenex at the beginning because people bring back people that they love during this journey. And I think it's so important, so important that people enjoy what we have today, but also understand that we are now the caretakers and the baton holders of this great, great life that the greatest generation and subsequent people have handed to us. And it's so important to honor that history, to thank our soldiers, to act appropriately when you hear our pledge or the Star Spangled Banner, and more importantly, to realize that your part is doesn't have to be to go fight a war, but at least let it be to look to your left and your right and the person in front of you because someone in your community feels despair today. And if that's what we do, just a little action like that to honor the history and the freedoms and the liberties that we've been given, that's really the best thing that we can do as caretakers. So I like to say that A Thousand Letters Home is accompanied by the journey of the letters that really leaves people with the charge of citizenship in today's world. The letters are beautiful and they're interesting, but the real question is, what are you going to do with what you know? And what are you going to do to make a difference to make your life purposeful? Because we all have a huge debt of gratitude that we owe to those who have defended our freedom. My guest is Teresa K. Irish, and her book and her late father's book is called A Thousand Letters Home. It's compiled by messages he sent home from the big one, World War II. If you have an eye to purchasing a copy of A Thousand Letters Home, learn more about the stories at a thousand letters home.com. You can also reach Teresa on Twitter at thousand letters or facebook.com slash a thousand letters home. And I wanted to quote something here from the Military Writers Society of America, which I think was a really high compliment to you and a thousand letters home. They put it on their recommended reading list and they called it a treasure trove, which is really what it was in that trunk. That's what I'm picturing, Davy Jones's locker, even though I've seen the picture on the cover. <laughs> All the people that didn't get the chance to write these letters or maybe didn't have your father's articulate ability to put down his words, it's so great that he was self-deprecating at only 20 or doubting himself. Could we all have doubts at that age? But what other reactions are you getting there from veterans that they read it? Because we're losing hundreds of them a day, but we still have some World War II veterans with us. Have any of them given you their reflections on the book? Oh, sure. And I spend a lot of time after my events because it's so interesting how many people have something they need to tell you, whether it was their personal experience or their husband's experience. I get a lot of people that are returned to the program because they didn't know that the program would be that men would like it so much. And they bring back kind of that staunch veteran who comes in with his arms crossed, sitting in the chair and by the end of it openly shares a lot of emotion. 
And also really interesting, I, I notice a lot more lately that I have people who come to the event because they've recently lost a parent and they're hoping that maybe there's something new that they can learn. You know, I had a woman write me, actually called me recently and left a message because she is trying to find the story of her husband and he's been gone for 19 years. And she said, I read your book and I know my husband was somewhere in Texas, so maybe this was his journey. So as I said, although these are my dad's words, they're the journey of all of our soldiers through World War II. And I, I hope that they bring some healing to people to sort of give a little more insight for uh, for things that they, they can't go back and ask today, but uh, we can still continue to grow and honor those memories. Do you have a favorite of those photos that were taken in Europe that you saw for the first time there in the trunk? You know, my absolute favorite, and the cover picture only shows his head with it, but my absolute favorite actually is one of him sitting on his duffel bag at the train station in Detroit. It's just an absolutely charming and handsome and sweet photograph. I would be hard pressed to pick a favorite. We actually had a hard time having to edit out so the book didn't get too big. <laughs> All of the, the photo options, but that's one of my very favorite is the one of him sitting there. And uh, there's some really great ones of he and his buddies when they're waiting to come home in eight months in an army of occupation. And they've got some pretty great photographs there too. So it was one thing just to have the letters, as you might imagine, Dean, but to have the visuals as well to bring it to life. It, it was just an astounding find. It sent me back a really long time. <laughs> yeah. And to put in all those pictures is not easy if you had gone the traditional publishing route. Usually they want to tell you, well, so many pictures, X number, do you have the rights, this and that. Maybe somebody in the picture would not want to be in it or you would have to choose. And this enabled you to have your heart be your editor for those kind of things. And it's still a professional product. It's not as if there's anything lacking. But I just felt the pictures added such an incredible dimension because you talked about young people today that maybe lost a grandparent or lost a father or have their mother or father deployed. You can enjoy this book, even if you're too young to read it completely and understand some of the themes about wanting to get married, but you can look to the pictures and see so much in there. And I just thought, what a great idea, because I wasn't expecting pictures. I heard the name A Thousand Letters Home, and I thought, oh, okay, these are going to be some of his best letters. As you said, a lot of these books are a bunch of different perspectives and diary entries and whatnot, but these are really photos. It's a, almost a photo journey. You could have made this a coffee table book. Yeah, it was very <laughs> it was very overwhelming to figure it all out. And, and I I did, as I said, I wrote to like 60 publishing houses. I kind of became a stalker. I wrote to Tom Hanks, Tom Brokaw, Tim Russert before he passed away. I sent some sample letters, uh, excerpts rather. And about two months after I wrote to Tom Brokaw, I got a letter from his people saying, thank you, but his schedule is very busy and does not allow him to help you. But then they must have read a couple of the letter samples I sent because then a couple months after that, I received an affidavit all filled out with my name and my dad's name, turning the letters over to the Tom Brokaw collection. And although I didn't know how to bring a book to print, I knew by that time that I had to make sure that the letters maintained the original integrity exactly as they were written and that I could pepper the photographs in as they went. So ultimately, I did end up going the self-publishing route and... My family, my husband, my sisters, my mother became a huge part of that journey with me. And uh, it was a five and a half year labor of love, but we've done really, really well. We've been through our second printing already. And as I said, just had our 200th presentation and have about 40 more this fall already. So it's been wonderful. I've left the corporate world and I do this full time because it, it's just a really, really important message, both to our veterans, to family members of people that served and just to young people to learn their history. So I, I really literally mean it when I say this has changed my life. <laughs> and your mother, you mentioned, and people might have just glossed over that or missed it. Uh, and I know I thought it at first. I said, how old is this lady? She's 93 just last month in July of 2015. And happy birthday to her, of course. I don't want to forget to say that. Where are my manners? Um, but what was her reaction to this book? I, I know that that's one of those generic question, but what was it? I want to know. Well, my mother is, she's a tiny little thing. She's probably 4'10". Greatest person I've ever known. She married my dad, went on to raise 10 children, wow. gave us a wonderful life and home. At first, she couldn't really imagine why anybody would have any interest in their correspondence. But as I got going through this process, actually, she really surprised me. 
I was about oh, quite a few months into my dad's letters. Actually, it was Thanksgiving and we hosted it at my house to change things up a bit. My mother arrives at my house. She drives 90 miles at 84 years old into the Detroit area for Thanksgiving. <laughs> and she proceeds to tell me that she has 400 of her letters back to my dad's 1,000 letters for the first two years that he's stateside. And that is something we had no idea about. And that was just, I mean, my dad's letters enough were stunning, but my mother's, it was just, it was really something I, I had no idea. And I have to tell you, Dean, it was really, it was really something because when I started to read her letters, I was surprised to learn that her letters were sadder than my dad's because we forget what was happening stateside when all the soldiers and young men were away at war. And it was in a really, it's a really amazing insight of, of both sides and what was going on in America with the blackouts and the Rosie the Riveters. And in the course of the book, her mother's mother receives the last rites three times and she's got five little brothers and sisters. But this was a whole added dimension of insight into what was happening in America at that time on, on all different fronts. And it was just astounding. And I did ultimately, I think there's there's 10 or 12 of her letters included in the book. So the two-sided part of that was just another part that just was stunning. <laughs> Let's go to Amanda Reed doing a voiceover of one of your mother's letters. Merrill, Michigan, December 25th, 1942. Friday, Christmas night, 8.15. Dearest Bud, well, another Christmas nearly gone, and without you... It's been very lonely. I knew when you went away that I'd be lonesome, but I really didn't think it would be as bad as it was today. I'm sure you weren't out of my mind for a minute. Your folks came up today about 2.30, and was I ever glad to see them. Alice Adele, Ray, Larry, Faith, Joyce, and your mom and dad. They all brought me presents, and I just didn't know what to say. You know the fuller brush that Joyce has that I liked so well? Alice Adele and Ray gave me one and two lucite combs made by the Fuller Company besides. They sure are lovely. Faith and Joyce gave me the prettiest pink necklace I ever saw. It will go swell with any of my clothes. Your mom and dad gave me a box of handkerchiefs and just before your dad left he gave me a crisp new dollar bill. They surely have been swell to me and I can go to visit your folks and feel just as contented and at home as I can in my own home. I don't know how I'll ever make it up to them for all they've done for me, but I'm sure being truly faithful to their son makes them happy, and I surely intend to do so. We went to Midnight Mass last night. If you went too, I'm sure your emotions were as deeply touched as mine were. It was beautiful, wasn't it? It seemed just like heaven, didn't it? It seems as though if Hitler or Mussolini or Hirohito could attend a service like that, they would realize how wonderful peace is and would never cause war again. But I guess those fellows haven't any heart, so it would be pretty hard to convince them. I also went to two masses this morning. That made three in all. I offered my midnight mass and holy communion for our intention, the second mass for mom and our family's health, and the third for you alone, to keep you safe, good, and happy and to return you home safely to me soon. I received your two Christmas cards yesterday, and your letter, too. Those cards were surely pretty. The verses inside were beautiful, weren't they? They surely know how to express things, don't they? Rosemarie said she surely thinks you are a thoughtful kid. I showed her the two cards yesterday and the one you sent me in remembrance of our anniversary on December 18th, too. She said... Most fellows wouldn't even bother their heads about a card for that. December 18th, she meant. That made me feel pretty proud, of course. Well, we'll close, I guess, and have a little lunch, then go to bed. Good night, and I hope telling you how lonesome I was today won't make you lonesome. I feel better now that I've written you about it. Pleasant dreams. It's such a, a naive, yet heartbroken, yet pure, yet hopeful little thing about just these few bad people in the world that have impacted so many. Thinking about all of these different things that were happening in life and the heartache and the endurance, and I think even more so, it makes people understand when you, you read her perspective on things, 
why they were all called the greatest generation, because they came back and they were very modest with a great work ethic. I mean, our family always had family dinners together and we had to kneel in prayer every night and we sang as a family. And I didn't grow up hearing, you know, when I was a child or how I grew up. And yet I think that only has helped in my later years, if it was even possible to gain a greater respect for my parents and for what they lived through and ultimately the life they gave us in contrast. I think it's a perfect note to end on. Teresa Irish, thank you so much for introducing your father to us today. I feel like he has been here with us. Certainly, I'm starting to get to know him through the letters. And the way you shared it, you shared his heart, really. It wasn't just him. And I think that's a hard thing because a lot of people would want to just keep his love all to themselves. But you shared it with all of us. Your mother shared hers back. Your father signed a lot of his letters with the phrase, worlds of love. And I felt like you shared that with all of us. So thank you very much. And I hope you join us again. And I hope you'll Give yourself a little plug here and let people know where they can get a hold of you if they want you to come and do some public speaking about the book near them. Sure, we'd be delighted. Um, on our website, a thousandlettershome.com, we have the whole book's introduction, the forward from the book. We have a number of letter excerpts, photographs, upcoming events, and also information on how to get uh, to get hold of me by e- email or phone. But we'd be delighted to bring the story to more and more communities and continue the conversation. And I'm just really proud and honored to have been my parents' daughter and be the conduit to do this. So, and I can't thank you enough, Dean, for inviting me to join you. Well, the pleasure was all mine. And I'm sure for everybody listening and everybody that goes to a thousand letters home.com and hopefully reads the book and has a real unique view here of World War II from both sides of the Atlantic. A thousand letters home. As always, you can find the link to purchase the book at our website, historyauthor.com, and we do hope you'll click through there. We get a few stamps in our ration book every time you do. Once again, I want to thank Teresa Irish for joining us and for sharing her father's personal letters. Please remember to visit Teresa's website, a thousandlettershome.com, to follow her on Twitter at Thousand Letters, and to toss her a like at facebook.com slash a thousand letters home. And remember, let us know what you think of her book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. Well, that's it for this week's installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us next week for another trip into the past here on iHeartRadio, iTunes, or wherever you're listening. And remember, if you do subscribe to us on iTunes, please leave a review. Until next Monday morning, thanks so much for listening, and happy reading. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.